Now on Exhibition for Chickens TV, we present an interview with a scientist about sight in chickens. Professor Graham Martin is an ornithologist uh, with an international reputation uh, for the study of the sensory world of birds and uh, he's joining me now to talk all things uh, Exhibition for Chickens, so thank you Graham. Okay, um, well, nice to see you. <laughs> Would you be able to maybe explain um, some of the, the key features of bird vision and how they might differ to, to okay. our own sort of view of the world. Yeah, I mean, the, the important thing, I suppose the important message is to say that birds are not going to see the world in the same way as we do. You know, we, we have a particular take on the world. We see the world a particular way. Other animals see the world in other ways. There's differences in colour vision. We, we know something about that generally. Um, it's highly likely that most birds are going to see much finer colour discriminations than we can, so they can see more subtlety, as it were, in colour in the world. Um, they've probably got, and this would apply to chickens, a slightly broader spectrum than we've got, so they'll see colours going into the UV or the near UV that we are unaware of, or parts of the spectrum, so there's a little bit broader information there for them um, but the probably the main difference for birds and ourselves is that we see the world basically as in front of us because we've got two eyes on the front of our head and when you think about it that's a very strange thing if you look across the animal kingdom there aren't many animals which have two eyes on the front of the head that just look forwards mm. um, we tend to see the world always in front of us and we I always think that you feel that you're moving into the world you know that's your experience and as soon as you've moved into it you just don't know what's up, what's behind you you know I mean only memory tells you that but you don't actually know it you're not getting any information with birds and lots of other animals but birds in particular and it will certainly apply to chickens um, their eyes are on the side of the head they're looking slightly forward but they're on the side of it. And they're looking outwards, and each eye sees a very different view of the world uh, to the other. So my way of conceptualising what birds are doing is that they actually flow through the world. You know, they see the world in front of them, certainly, in the same way as we do, but they see all the world around them as well. Uh, and as they move forward, so the world flows past them, and they sort of see the world retreating. Wow. So it doesn't just cut off. Yeah. Um, now... In terms of how I appreciate the world in an art exhibition, uh, <laughs> for example, I, I would have thought that the real problem for them is that they can't get away from it. Because yeah. when you think about it, if you've got all-embracing vision, they see a lot above their head as well, as well as right down behind them and things like that. But wherever they look, <laughs> they're going to be seeing something. We have the luxury, as it were, of turning the world off by looking away. I mean, if I walk up to a work of art and think, oh, God, it's rubbish. I can turn and walk away from it and not see it anymore. Chicken has to move a long, long way away. So it doesn't, right. doesn't see it at all. So does uh, that, can that tell you something about how they, would they find it hard to concentrate on on one thing? Is well, that... may, maybe. I mean, what well, you've got to think of their best, uh, our best line of vision is in front. You know, we, we tend to look at something and we, you know, we know when we're looking at something very clearly. Their best line of vision in, in most birds is actually laterally. It's going out sideways from the head like that. Uh, and so their best line of vision is sort of out there and out there. So if a pigeon, oh, sorry, a chicken, <laughs> I always think about pigeons, but if a chicken wants to really see, see something, it turns its head like that. It doesn't look at it forwards. Yes. You know, we tend to think... The, you know, if, if the chicken's really looking at something, it's going to look forward at it. But if it really wants to examine something with some detail, it will turn its head sideways and have a look. And you can see this all the time, you know, if you're outside watching birds or even with your chicken. It really uses only the frontal vision for the business of pecking and getting at something that it's already taken an interest in yeah. with its lateral view. But of course, it has two lateral views, two areas, so it can keep keep a check on a lot more of the world than what we can. So, so do, do you if you have look at your chicken, you know, and he's interested in a work of art, he might be going that way to yeah. it. And then if he hates it, he might be pecking at it. But but it's the sideways thing that will be the way that they amazing. really are looking. And uh, do you and have then, ways of modelling this so that you can see, you know, can you uh, simulate um, 
the way it's, a, a bird looks yeah. so that we can it's get It's very that difficult sense. because I, I've studied what, what I'm describing is the visual field of a bird. Uh, and I've studied visual fields in about 60 different species, choosing ones with different ecology, different uh, relationships, uh, and finding huge differences a- across them. But the trouble is, it's a three dimensional thing. It's what surrounds your head. Uh, and rendering that in a way that's easily understandable is actually really very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can draw diagrams where you plot it on a globe, but then you've still got to get yourself inside the globe. You know, you've got to imagine yourself into it. Um, so it's very difficult to just sort of say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's like this. Yeah. But I think the thing to think of, it, it, the world is surrounding them all the time. And as they move around, move their heads, the world, they're, they're still seeing all the world. Whereas we move our head like that, I turn like that, it's gone from behind me and I don't have to look at it anymore. But birds can. I mean, it's very good reason for doing this because most of the time they're looking out actually for predators. It's yeah. all to do with who's coming after me behind. But it means that they can keep monitoring all of the world. I mean, there are some birds... And I don't know whether you've got any ducks and geese. Have you uh, yes, we do. I mean, you know, farmyard geese are just basically, but ducks rather, are basically just mallards. Yeah. And mallards are one of the birds that can see all around their head and all above their head. They don't have a blind area at all. Wow. So that they, you know, they're always, when, when a mallard is sitting doing nothing, looking forward, yeah. it does know everything around it and everything above it. Wow. So going around an art exhibition means that, it just sees everything all the time, or can potentially. Yeah. See so perhaps the the, a couple of artists have done um, uh, more sort of immersive experiences with sound. Right. Um, so right. that might be more appealing, I guess, to a chicken than a well, than, yeah, a, than a picture yeah. in two D. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that'd be interesting yeah. to see. Talking of predators, so one someone asked me to ask you what I mean. Why do they? Why do birds see humans as predators? Well, it depends on what species you're talking about and, and, and individual experiences. But I, a lot of birds moving away from humans, it's just learnt behaviour, right. learnt when you're very young from previous adults. So it's getting passed down through generations, through generations. You go to some locations, uh, you know, seabird islands and this sort of thing, where humans don't have a long history of persecuting birds, and they don't. And, and individual birds can become tolerant of you, you know, anyway. You know, they, they learn that you are safe. Yeah. I mean, I've got a blackbird in my garden that I, mean, I can walk two or three feet from it. It doesn't bother. It knows who I am. But I know that that individual bird is actually at least lived with me for five years. It was, a, right. it was ringed by somebody five years ago. It's okay. still alive. It's still there. Um, so it's had a long period. So I hope its offspring won't be too alarmed by me, you know. Well, that's interesting. But, but, but a fresh one, you know, might well be learning from its parent to, to, to dash it's away. Like the, but yeah. they are cute, cute to look for predators. Uh, and, you know, they're basically, if they are fleeing, they're seeing you as a predator. So another, another question that someone wanted me to ask was about sound. Can you say something about the way sound travels and how that might affect a, the the a sense of territory in a bird? Well, I think there, there's some quite good work done on uh, hearing in birds, definitely. They can see the, exactly the same range of sounds as we can, probably actually a slightly narrower range of sounds than we can. Um, so the sound world that you experience is going to be really quite similar to the sound world of birds. There's no sort of secret high frequency or low frequency channels that you find in some of the mammals, for example, you know, so- sounds that we can't hear that they can hear. Birds are hearing the same sort of world as we can. Um, the problem that they have with sounds compared with us is that they have, it's much more difficult to them to locate a sound. Um, we can locate sounds pretty well, but that's because we've got a big head, ears well separated, and a, and a solid head in between. And that means the sound that we hear at one ear to the other ear um, are really, I mean, subtly, but they're really quite different. And it's those differences that we are able to use mm. to locate where a sound source is coming from. Right. So there has to be quite a bit of learning going on, but we can do it quite well. Whereas birds, much smaller head, ears much closer together, the, the cues aren't there, so their ability to actually locate sounds is, is actually a lot worse than ours. Right. So their response to 
the sound of a predator is not to necessarily know exactly where it's coming from. So it's a general alert. You know, they want to be able to say, oh, oh there's a sound coming, I need to take an interest, but they won't necessarily know where it is. So that's, that's a problem for them uh, and, and may explain some of their sort of flight behaviour when a loud sound comes. They just don't know where it's coming from. It might be a problem, so they go. Yeah. See what I'm, that sort of thing. And then and just go back to colour as well. Um, so yeah. what you're saying about colour and seeing a sort of wider range of colour and UV, um, why, why is that? Well, <laughs> if you actually cast around the animal kingdom, it, it's us that's a bit more exceptional. Right. Lots of other animals do see into the UV. A lot of other mammals do. Oh, and how do you know that as well? What's the? How, how can you, know? you tell what they what what spectrum they see? Oh gosh, <laughs> you have to do either very elaborate training experiments where you you set up a situation where a bird is making a choice or an, any animal making a choice between two stimuli, two light sources, say that you put up. And you make it very obvious that these two light sources are different, you know, very bright or very different colours and yeah. things like that. And you start to reward them if they go towards oh, one yeah. compared with another one. And then once you've got them really working on this, they're really able to do the task, you can then start manipulating the lights and you can find out where the limits of what they can see is, you know. But that's really quite elaborate and, and, and laborious. It takes months, literally, because you only get so many trials a day. But you can get very good data out of that, telling you all sorts of things about, you know, their acuity, the ability to see detail, but also the breadth of their visible spectrum, for mm. example, you can actually test. But you can also do some physiology and anatomy, and that can give you clues as well as to just where the you know, limits of their visible spectrum is. But the vi limits of the visible spectrum for us, you know, it's we live with a slightly narrower spectrum than lots of other animals. So that's and the but, question, isn't it? Why is that? Why why have we um, developed yeah, to, to take in less UV. data and less information? Yeah. Well, but U UV is is a problem. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, it is cumulatively UV exposure does damage your eyes. Maybe it's partly because we're so long lived. You right. don't want to expose your eyes to UV for too long. Um, and it would damage the retina over a long period of time, not immediately, but over a long period of time. Um, but also it's actually more difficult to focus UV light than, than other parts of the spectrum. So if you're evolving an eye or, you know, evolution has led you to have an eye with high acuity, you might actually want to get rid of the UV because it stops you having a really sharp image. If you really want to get good UV images, you have to have very expensive lenses on your camera, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in human eyes, actually the cornea at the front of the eye and, and the lens actually filter out the UV. UV is there but it doesn't get into your eye right. and it's filtered out. And that might be obviously to reduce some sort of damaging effect, but also because having it there would have impeded our, you know, high acuity, our ability yeah. to see detail. Now, something like a chicken won't see anything as detailed as we can. You know, our acuity, our ability to see fine detail. So the subtlety in your artworks mm. may be lost on a pigeon, on a, on a chicken, right? Yeah. As well as there will pigeons. be pigeons well, visiting, I'm sure. Yeah, as so. well as a pigeon. They, you know, because they're, they're, their acuity isn't as good as ours. Yeah. So if, if you've got an artist who's put very fine detail in there, yeah, uh, I mean, how, I mean, it, it might not be resolved by the bird. No. I mean, there's lots of portraiture. But, uh, <laughs> people have, so there's some good chicken oh, right, portraiture. Yeah, okay. And I, I was like, well, you know, maybe they don't want to see themselves but then my daughter said well if you go to the national portrait gallery or whatever yeah it's full of pictures of humans so that's not necessarily true and so someone has done some provocative work like a oh you haven't got your glasses on but and i'd say a ferocious you. looking cat all oh, right okay. um do you think <laughs> i i i guess from what you're saying that the the chicken is most likely just to see a blur when well, looking at that, and blur, isn't, isn't going to be probably, scared by a. It's not probably going to see that as a as a as a cat. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot of human interpretation gone into that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and the, yeah. The, 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 what else? 
I mean, I think this is beautiful, but the. Um, Let's have a look at this one. Right, yeah. I mean, what they would make of that, I've no idea. I mean, they might think that there's something there to peck at because you've yeah. got a, a focus of a, a structure or that, something you investigate, and then you might peck at it, think it might be food, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I think so. And then. What else is interesting? I mean, yeah, and something like this. Oh, right, okay. Abstract. Well, yes, I mean, well, I've no idea what they would do no. with that. I mean, they, I think we could say that they would see them because it's got strong outlines. You don't need fine acuity to see that. You've got strong yeah. colours. That They would appreciate all of those elements in that. Yeah. Definitely, I, you know. Yeah. Well, well, we'll they see, like I it suppose. Not, we, not a <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you can't find out. Um and just before we go, so you were telling me, so it's, uh, I, I checked, and so the next fourth synth is Heather Phillipson, who makes work, actually did um, a big uh, artwork based around eggs at Gloucester Road oh, Tube right. Station. In, in the um, underground stadium. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. so it's been postponed, but you had some involvement in planning the, um, for, well, for the not, fourth synth. Well, lots of planning. I didn't influence the design of the whole fourth plinth. No, it's just that somebody, that one of the people who were involved in the fabricating of it, because as I understand it, what what is submitted is really a small version, and yeah. then that gets accepted. Then it has to be scaled up. And when they were coming to scale it up, um, the the people got, I don't know who who actually, maybe the people who look after Trafalgar Square were a bit worried about whether, in fact, the rotating blades of the the drone, which is a feature of it. Uh, would be a hazard to pigeons, mm. uh, you know, the, the famous pigeons of Trafalgar Square. Um, and so I was asked, you know, what what would these rotating blades be a problem? How could we make them more conspicuous for a pigeon, uh, make sure it's not going to land on it and then get chopped up by the blades? Mm. Um, but I think we overcame that really um, by um, reducing the speed of rotation. Right. Uh, and I think they might be doing something about the colour of the blades to make them a little bit more conspicuous. Right. But it, it didn't didn't seem to be too much of a hazard to me when we looked at it. It would have been if the blades had been turning at the speed at which, you know, drone blades really turn, because that's very fast and you can't resolve that. And it would be quite likely that they could land on it. Mm. But I think the there's a compromise there that they're going to be rotating relatively slowly to indicate what they are, yeah, but they would be obvious, you know, obviously seen, yeah, yeah. So a bird would um, might land on something that's spinning very far, or try and land on something yeah. fast because they couldn't distinguish that it was yeah, actually moving. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, actually, if, if it's if it's moving slow, it would just see something moving slowly and think, "I'm not going to try and land on that," you know. Yeah. So that's, that's good. Well, that so that's, sorry, but it was yeah. it was interesting exercise to actually get involved yeah. in that. And yeah. you ha I guess you have influenced the work in in some way now. Oh, I, I'm yeah. sure I have. <laughs> Let's get a credit. I may um, I may have you know undermined its whole meaning for all yeah. I know. But I don't know. But uh, but yeah, I mean, but it was an interesting consideration because um, I've I've been involved in quite a lot of work about um, birds and flying into obstacles such as wind turbines and power lines and things like that. And there the emphasis initially started out, well, how do we scare the birds away? Yeah. Just, you know, we've got to have this here, scare mm. the birds away. Um, whereas it's coming round now, and that's where I came in, to how do you make it so that it may be more conspicuous to mm. the bird? So rather than just, we've just got to get rid of the birds, we yeah. adapt what we've got. You do hear about developers kind of covering hedges and things to stop birds yeah. nesting in them and things like that and yeah. i wonder is that just an anomaly is gen generally are people a bit more I, well i think that? in terms of in terms of the hazards which i've been interested in um which include power lines and wind turbines and also i've got involved in birds getting caught in nets underwater fishing nets you, you know uh, diving birds things like that uh, and the emphasis is is more towards accommodating whatever you're doing around the bird and what the bird's world is. I've been involved in designing a, a new thing, a new device to hang on power lines that right. is designed to be conspicuous to a bird at certain distances so that the birds are much more likely to see it than the older ones and mm. uh, the older designs. And then they could take avoiding action, yeah. you know, that sort of thing.
Yeah. So there's, no, there's been a, I mean, that's, that's quite good. I mean, people are starting to appreciate that the world to other animals isn't the world as we see it. And that's, that's the important thing. You know? and, then, and then I guess, I mean, just um, a final thought. Obviously, we're, we're living in a kind of weird time where uh, we're all at home and uh, yeah, the, yeah. Na- nature is sort of thriving in, in many ways, isn't it? Is that, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do you see any kind of changes going forward as things start to to go back to normal well i don't know about the things go back to i think the birds will, the birds and the mammals will just you know disappear again into the bushes as it were i mean yesterday i was driving just just to go to the shops yesterday uh and there were two two roe deer in the field you know just out grazing I mean, this is nine o'clock in the morning um and i've never seen them there before but i knew they were in the woods nearby but they've obviously it's a lot lot quieter you know far fewer cars so these, these 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 deer were out, you know. So that was great, you know. They were, you know, they were. There was a benefit to them. But I imagine once the traffic volume goes up again, they'll just disappear back into the woods, which is a yeah. shame. Um, so I suspect we, yeah. Although our lockdown seems to be a long time and all, oh, it's terrible. It hasn't really been very long mm. in terms of you know the world, the natural world. No. The real changes to have, have come in place, you know. Um, Traffic on roads is going to be the most obvious thing, you know. There, there's certainly been fewer pheasants being run down on the roads near me, sort of thing. And that may have had a little knock-on effect because of the crows and the buzzards come and eat the carcasses. So there's probably been a little bit less food, but it will soon revert. It's a shame, but it will soon revert. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to lock down for at least a year before we'll see real changes. But, <laughs> but there have it. been changes. I, <laughs> mean, that, I mean, I suppose the important thing is that even within a few weeks, there have been changes. Like yeah. you know, me seeing the deer coming out in the day where they, they never would before, you know. Yeah, that's so interesting, it, it's isn't it? It's all responsive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When, when people talk about, um, you know, cha- making changes for the environment and, and the, the sort of common argument is it's not, it's not going to make a difference, you know. A little thing well, like that, but actually you can see that just yeah, you know, just in six weeks six or so, weeks. it does make a difference. Yeah. You know I mean, you know, so maybe people have more confidence to think, well, we ought to try and change things more permanently because things do respond. You know, so that's very good. Yeah, great. Oh yeah. well, that's a good good point to end it. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks so much. Take care. All right then. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.